Coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition, why medical marijuana patients may feel the biggest impact from statewide raids on pot growing operations. Also, the head of SDSU Sports explains why moving Aztec football to the Big East will have a big impact. And a San Diego assemblyman says he supports the governor's proposed tax increases. We put Ben Weso on the record. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Farian. And I'm Dwayne Brown. San Diego County's Narcotics Task Force says the number of illegal marijuana seizures on public and private property is down two years in a row. It recovered more than $1.2 million worth of assets from raids this year, but the biggest impact will likely be on patients of medical marijuana dispensaries. As we move through here, you can see that this is starting to bud out. Drug enforcement agents, along with county sheriff deputies, have raided more than 80 outdoor sites this year. They also shut down 67 indoor operations, where agents say much of the pot for medical marijuana comes from. Uh, about 78 percent of our dispensaries here locally have either closed or we don't intend to close based on the U.S. Attorney's uh, letter of warning. And that is going to have a significant impact on the number of indoor grows, particularly that we find. Because the indoor grows that we find, most of them were fueling the uh, dispensaries here in San Diego. Agent Sherman says illegal cultivation continues to be a problem in areas like Palomar Mountain and the Cleveland National Forest in San Diego's North County. They've used screen to dry the marijuana plants. Those are the places we routinely find uh, marijuana grows year in and year out. So it's a real danger to our kids. This mother of two teenage boys lives in Pacific Beach. She says shutting down the illegal growers is making a difference. The efforts to get rid of the supply are really good because once if you, re if you reduce the supply, that's going to reduce, reduce the amount that gets into the hands of our kids. I mean, it's just simple um, you know, arithmetic. The Narcotics Task Force made 107 arrests this year and recovered about 71 weapons. Agents say their stepped-up efforts are driving growers out of San Diego County and into Riverside or farther north. We have another very cold night ahead with rain expected by this weekend. The Weather Service has issued a frost advisory for the San Diego County coast and for the valleys. The blue shaded area on this map, well, that shows where the advisory is in effect. Temperatures are expected to drop into the 20s. Managers of San Diego's temporary winter homeless shelter in Barrio Logan say they expect to house more than 200 people tonight, and they're still asking for blankets. The state has fined Scripps Hospital in La Jolla $100,000 for leaving an object inside a patient after surgery. The California Department of Public Health says doctors left a small pin less than three centimeters long inside a woman who later suffered discomfort and difficulty breathing. She had to have a second operation to remove the pin. The state says the problem may have been an incorrect reading of an x-ray or a miscommunication error. Scripps says it's taken steps to prevent such incidents from happening again. San Diego Chargers won't be on television this weekend. The team fell about 5,000 tickets short of a sellout needed to lift the NFL blackout. This will be the second TV blackout of the season. The Chargers have one more home game after this Sunday. That's on December 18th. From Chargers football to Aztec, San Diego State's athletic department is gearing up for more money thanks to a big change. Joanne is talking about it with her guests at the Evening Edition Roundtable. San Diego State's athletic department is set to collect a whole lot of cash now that it's making the switch from the Mountain West Conference to the Big East. This change only affects the Aztec football team. When it takes effect in 2013, SDSU could collect as much as $6 million a year more than it's getting from its current conference. But University President Elliot Hirschman said yesterday that there's more to it than money. We're very, very excited to be joining the Big East. Uh, we think it's an opportunity for our football team to compete at the absolute highest level. And it's also an opportunity for us to be involved with some of the top universities in the country. And so all in all, it's just tremendous, tremendous opportunity for us. We're thrilled. Joining me now is Jim Sterk, SDSU Athletic Director. Jim, thanks for being here. Joanne, thanks for having me on. So how is it even possible that a team on the West Coast gets to join the Big East Conference? It is a little bit crazy when you first look at it, and obviously with the name Big East, and most of the teams have been there, but, but they're creating a Western division of the Big East uh, with us in Boise, the most Western 
uh, partners. And it's not really different than what our schedule had this year. We had two games in the Eastern time zone, two games in the Mountain time zone, and none in California of our five away games. So really it, it doesn't change much. And football is a sport that you can do that with because it's one game a week, uh, usually on a Saturday, and, and it's only 12, 12 games. So uh, it, it works, and it, it's an exciting move for us. Let's talk about the money. So why is it that now you can, you can collect millions more a year in revenue well the um, the Big East the footprint of the Big East with with the schools that they added will be 28 million households that'll be the largest uh, number of households in the in the uh, any of the conferences the BCS conferences any conference and so they will be going to to bid with their their contract in fall of 2012 before we join the league and so they feel our consultants feel that that it's it's a, a good time to come there's competition and they're the last BCS conference to go into the to the bidding uh, of their rights fee now, you can't really have a conversation these days about uh, colleges without talking about money and tuition and increases. We know that in the last several years, students have been asked to pay um, not just more in tuition, but also fees, athletic fees for one. It went from $30, I think it was in 2004, now it's $350 uh, in athletic fees. Will some of this money now, this new revenue, be returned to students? Well, it, it, the students, and, and it's not just athletics that receive it, it's, it's club sports and recreation that receive some of that. And, and, uh, and, and so w with us, we've kind of gone the way everyone else has in the last few years. We've lost 25 full-time employees, 12 part-time. Um, and, and when I came, we had a $3.3 .3 million uh, deficit, and that was just under two years ago. So we've been trying to fight out of, the, out of a hole as well as, as everyone else. And, and uh, moving forward, we, we, we do have challenges with increased tuition. Our tuition and, uh, and scholarship fees have gone from $2.5 million eight, eight years ago to over six point four right now. And so our bills continue to rise, and, and everyone wants us to be competitive nationally and, and, and compete. Um, so that's the challenge, and, and that's why it's important uh, not only you know, with this move to the Big East for the, to playing at the highest level, competing at the highest level, being in a BCS conference, but also uh, the revenues that it, that it could provide. Now, so do you see going yeah. forward some of the money maybe being yeah, th well, these fees being Yeah, well, you know, at the end of, end of the day, it's the president's decision. And, and so we, if we have and we go through and we were able to, you know, um, build our program back up uh, employee-wise and, and have, have the support that we need to be successful, then at the end of the day, at the end of a fiscal year, we may say, oh, there's, you know, half a million or a million dollars that may go to the library or somewhere else that around on campus. And, and athletics departments, as they're able to do that, um, uh, have done that in the past, and, and we would like to do that. That would be fun. Do you lose anything by making this switch? You know, the, uh, there's uh, people talk about rivalries, and, and, and in the Mountain West, um, uh, San Diego State's gone through an evolution. They played in the Pacific Coast League, and they played in the WAC, and they played, and the Mountain West started in 1999. But uh, I don't think there's even half of the members left uh, in the Mountain West from when we started. And, and then Boise, a new member that was coming in this year, or came in this year, is going for sure. So. BYU, Boise, TCU, uh, Utah, uh, all those, those schools are gone from the league. And so really, Boise uh, is probably, you know, will be our closest rival in the future, and, and that'll be a fun one to keep. In terms of now the other teams over at SDSU, do you see uh, movement? happening there as well? Yeah, the, the Mountain West, and they, they've considered it, you know, keeping our programs in, in um, without football, but, but in, at the end of the day, their, their bylaws require you to have all your sports, football especially, and, and so our, the rest of our programs, we have a couple options, and we're looking at those, and probably have an announcement on that within a week uh, on where those programs are. The, the options are the Big West or the Western Athletic Conference, and and those, both of those gives us more proximity, uh, less travel, uh, less missed class time, uh, that opportunity. And, and uh, they're also both um, with ESPN that, that helps the kids as they, you know, they want to play on ESPN. And so that, that really helps on the, on the recruiting side. And, uh, you know, the travel and the cost, I think, will be, be less than what it is with the Mountain West right now. Jim Sterk, thank you so much for being here. Joanne, thanks.
San Diego Unified will have to make some tough choices to balance its budget, but an inner city school is fighting a plan to split the campus up. That story coming up in our public square. And we'll show you a group working to keep parolees from returning to prison. This is KPBS Evening Edition. from an ordinary to an extraordinary life? Don't allow anybody else's opinions. Don't allow what it says on the internet. Don't allow the research. Don't allow what anybody out there tells you is possible or not possible. Join Dr. Wayne Dyer for Wishes Fulfilled, a joyful journey to manifesting your deepest desires while living from your highest self. Saturday at 7 on KPBS. Hi, I'm Elsa Sevilla. If you find yourself hearing about a great program on KPBS after it's already aired, we have a solution. Get notified about your favorite TV programs on KPBS before they air by subscribing to the TV Highlights email alert. This daily email will feature the best programs coming up right here on KPBS TV so you can make a date to tune in or plan to record it. It's easy to register. Just go to kpbs.org slash alerts. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Erwin Jacobs and by Welcome back to Evening Edition. Thousands of inmates from California's overcrowded prisons are being transferred to county jails under realignment. San Diego is one of a few counties trying to avoid building more jails to accommodate this new population. KPBS reporter Allison St. John says it's a tough assignment because many offenders don't have anywhere else to go. You never use the microwave for a noodle. 35-year-old Frederick Ray Cupido arrived recently in San Diego. I had no place to go. He has spent much of the last decade serving two terms in the Hatchaby State Prison near Bakersfield. I was incarcerated from 2003 to 2009 for um, an incident I had that was a, actually it was a violence while I was uh, under the influence. I got out in June of 2009 and started to do pretty well but not following through with what I was taught how to stay clean off of drugs. I fell back into my addiction again and got in trouble for a possession. Recupido was one of the 70% of state parolees who don't make it on the outside and end up back in prison. This time he's determined to make a go of it. It's uh, just coming to the point in my life where I'm just, um, I, I'm, I'm tired. I'm physically, mentally, and spiritually tired. He heard about a program in San Diego called Second Chance. He wrote to them from prison and was accepted. When he got out, he was given $200 gate money, just enough to get a set of clothes and toiletries and travel to San Diego. If I was left to my own device with no place to go, that money, that little bit of money I would have taken would either have gotten me under the influence or a criminal way of thinking would be to make more money with what I have. Instead, Recupero ended up here in this house. His rent is free for the first 60 days as long as he stays clean and sober. It's run by Second Chance, a nonprofit that works with post-release offenders. Let me hear from somebody who has a misdemeanor. John McCartney has been a county probation officer in San Diego for 14 years. Now he's on his toughest assignment, a caseload of 51 offenders who, like Recupero, come not from county jail but from state probation. Prison. I mean, what is different about this new population? Prison. Go to, you go to prison for a good term. You, uh, you spend uh, six years in prison. And like I said, on probation, come out there 90 days, you may be able to continue what you did prior to getting arrested and placed in custody. After six years, it's very hard to uh, come back and reestablish those real connections as far as those family ties. McCartney says almost half his clients have no place to stay when they get out of prison, and even the ones with family only get a temporary roof over their heads. It's kind of a letdown to them. You know, they get out, they go strictly directly to their parents, and they be like, hey, I'm home. And, you know, they get the look, uh, you're a temporary home, and we give you a, a meal, but you can't stay here because we don't want the law enforcement coming to the house. And, you know, we've reestablished our own ties, and we've kind of moved on. 
So it's kind of like an eye-opener for them. McCartney knows it will be more challenging for this population to reintegrate into the community than for someone coming out of a few months in county jail. San Diego County Probation Department will assume responsibility for more than 1,000 offenders from state prison within the next few months. Recupero is one of the lucky ones. He's landed in a program that gives him a place to stay and support to find a job. Once he's earning, he'll be able to transition into housing with a subsidized rent of about $425 a month. I think housing is very important. A person who comes out who doesn't have a place to stay really is behind the eight ball. I mean, there's like, what are you going to do? You don't. You actually need a residence in order to get a job, and you need a job in order to get a rent. You know, it's that it's that catch twenty two. You have to have one to get the other. So. It's really important for um, them to have a place to stay. I think that's crucial for a person to successfully complete probation. Though Recupido is still living with other ex-offenders, he's optimistic. It's a blessing that you know I get to go down and turn on the TV and cook food when I want to. If I want to walk down to the store, I'm able to do that. So I overlook the small things today. He says prisoners write to him from prison, and they're anxious about what realignment will mean for them. It's like the dog in the backyard is being released, and... Is it going to go out and cause havoc, or is it going to be like, okay, this is kind of cool, maybe I should just, you know, be, be a little more careful. In order to avoid building more jail cells, San Diego hopes to bring the recidivism rate for this new class of offenders down from 70% to 40%. That's the rate which the probation department has achieved with offenders coming out of county jail. It's still early in this whole process of the realignment, so I don't know how they're going to handle it. It's given me a freedom that's driven me to do better. Hey, Hi. how you doing? That's KPBS reporter Allison St. John. The county probation department is actively seeking community partners like Second Chance to help keep offenders out of jail, but there's no guarantee more state money will be available to support them. So would you be willing to pay more taxes for state services? Joanne is putting a San Diego legislator on the record at the Evening Edition Roundtable. Earlier this week, Governor Jerry Brown filed a ballot initiative with the Attorney General that would increase the state sales tax and increase income taxes for the wealthy. The governor said he was bypassing the legislature and going directly to the voters because he did not want to get bogged down in partisan gridlock. Joining me now to talk about where he stands on this initiative is Assemblymember Ben Wayso. He's a Democrat representing the 79th District in Southwest San Diego. Thank you, Assemblymember, for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's start with where do you stand on this initiative? Well, I, I, I stand in, in, in the position that we need more revenue for our state. Um, I, I, if this uh, initiative qualifies, I'll probably support it. Uh, we've been finding ways to, to bring more revenue to our state, and uh, we've, we've, we've uh, tried some common sense approaches, and uh, we just can't seem to get the support of other members. So, you know, it's our, our, our state is, a, is in a bad position. I want to ask you, and I want to ask your viewers, and maybe you can do a poll, to ask your viewers... How many people know that beginning July 1st of this year, taxes went down in California? I actually meet with a lot of people in the state, and I meet with a lot of groups. I, I met with a very large group of 100 people earlier uh, this month, and I asked that question. And, and since taxes went down, I've been taxes asking people. Taxes went down for who, though? What are you talking well, about Well, here it goes. I've asked people, how many people know that taxes went down in California? And nobody raised their hands. Our sales tax went down 1% beginning July 1st. Uh, our VLF, vehicle license fee, went down uh, half a percentage point. Uh, this was part of an agreement that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and the previous lecturer agreed five years ago. Uh, it, this represented about $14 billion to, to our budget. So beginning July 1st, we had $14 billion less to work in to funding education. For the past five years, we've been funding programs at the state. Now taxes went down. The argument is we should see more spending in retail. And, and there hasn't well, been an immediate rush to the store from Californians and buying we, more. We did have a, a mm. couple of um, uh, advocacy groups here, uh, both representing taxpayers. And, and uh, the San Diego County Taxpayers Association, one of the comments was that there are no guarantees, though. When you ask people to, to 
pay more in taxes. And for this particular initiative, the money would go directly to schools. There's no guarantee that spending more money on schools necessarily means you're going to have better educated kids. I think that seems to be one of the concerns of taxpayers. You know, are you spending money wisely? There is no doubt that we have so many un unmet needs in the state. We're not, uh, we're not, uh, uh, we don't have enough to, to fund mass transit, where there have been cuts in previous years, where, where does, does, uh, does increasing the fee to ride the trolley or the bus, is that going to increase ridership as well? I mean, we have a lot of goals that we, to, uh, in order to obtain them, we need to pro properly fund. In education, <clears throat> there, there is no doubt that, that reducing class size helps educational attainment. There's no Although doubt about that. Although studies say not necessarily class size. They say it's the number of school days actually has more of an outcome than, um, than I expanding your class size. Class size, reducing class size does have an impact. Expanding days ha does have an impact. Expanding hours does has, have an impact. All those cost money. What about the fact that the governor said he doesn't trust the legislature? He, and, and in fact, there was just a recent field poll that says the public doesn't really think that the legislature is doing a good good job and he's going directly to the voter. What does that say about the job that, that, that you and, and other assembly members are doing right now? We need to address the two-thirds rule. Bottom line, it's very hard in any form of government to reach a two-thirds consensus. Sixty-seven percent of the legislature, no council, no board of supervisors, no level of government requires that threshold to lead. It's hard. And you're talking about the two thirds. If it's tax reform, anything to do with taxes, you right. need a two thirds majority. Right. Anything having to do with uh, tax reform, revenue generation, <clears throat> states like very Republican states like Texas and Wyoming, and and uh, and Alaska tax oil. It's impossible to tax oil in, in in California without legislators doing it. We've tried it through the ballot. And, and the amount of money that's spent misleading voters about what's actually happening on, on, on tax, taxing oil, it, you know, what all the fears that they scare voters about pushing them away from, uh, from taxing oil are completely unfounded. We're, we're seeing that it's working in Alaska. You can reduce sales tax. You can reduce income tax if you find revenue sources that, that are, are we're are constant. To, we're going to have to leave it there. Quickly before we go with just a yes or no, do you su yes or no answer, do you support the Occupy movement? I do. I do because it's, I think it's a very American movement. It's about people expressing their views and their frustration with government. I think they're, they're poor people. They don't have uh, money to influence government, and they're doing it the only way they, they know how by speaking up. And I, I think Assembly speaking member up ben is, Weso is very American. Assemblymember Thank Ben Wayso, thanks for being here. Thank you. Republican Assemblymember Brian Jones, who represents Santee, will be here Monday to talk about where he stands on the governor's tax proposal. And in a moment, we'll hear from some City Heights neighbors fighting to save their school. This is KPBS Evening Edition. I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the next news hour, on the ground reports on Occupy protesters in San Diego, Oklahoma City, and Boise, Idaho. That's Thursday on the PBS News Hour. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. American Masters presents every kind of visual treat you can imagine. Charles and Ray Eames, the architect and the painter who became the top husband and wife design team of the 20th century. From furniture, the Eames chair, to filmmaking. The concept is mind-blowing. They thought outside the box before anyone even knew there was a box. Charles and Ray Eames. A happy, modern couple absorbed in their work. Enjoy Eames on American Masters. December 19th at 10, only on KPBS. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight, a story about an inner city school fighting back. This summer, the San Diego Unified School District proposed doing away with Crawford's small schools model to save money.
Crawford High School is divided into four small campuses, each with its own specialty. Traditional schools cost less, and the move could save the district about $370,000. The story now from our partners with the Speak City Heights Collaborative, Megan Burks and Brian Myers at Media Arts Center San Diego. <laughs> I hereby implore the San Diego Unified School District to abandon immediately any and all efforts to balance its budget on the backs of the district's poorest and most at-risk students. We're going by the school board's facts, and from what they've told us, that we're the only school that's going to get a reduction. It's about $370,000 is going to be taken away from Crawford. I understand we're in a deficit with the school board, but at the same time, there has to be equality, and there's no equity here, and that's really why everyone's upset. And the community is beginning to wonder as well, is this discrimination? Because it's not happening to any other community. It's happening to the lowest of low-income communities. It's the immigrant refugee community. All these folks who are brand new to the country may have come from a refugee camp, may have come from a country that doesn't have a democratic system. This campaign will not rest until the Crawford community is treated fairly. The school board will make a decision December 13th. If you would like to comment on this story, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, or just write to me directly, jfarian at kpbs.org. And now Dwayne has a recap of tonight's top stories. Narcotics officers seized nearly 200,000 marijuana plants in San Diego County this year. That's a decrease from last year. The seizures include indoor plants grown for medical marijuana dispensaries. Scripps Hospital has been fined $100,000 by the state for a surgical mistake. It left a metal pin inside a patient. The hospital says it's taken steps to prevent such mistakes in the future. And the Weather Service has issued another frost advisory tonight for San Diego's coast and valleys. Temperatures could drop into the 20s in some places. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night. We leave you with a look at the forecast.